Um, very quickly, um, uh, David Brin uh, is going to give us a, um, a, a, some, a quick talk here before we go to Robert Winter and we'll, I hope, stay on time. Um, Blake appears to have got seasick. Oh, he's back. Good. All right. He was looking very seasick for a moment there. Um, David Brin um, is a science fiction novelist, Earth, Kiln People, as he said here, and this was his own writing, his book, The Postman, was loosely Kevin Costnerized in 1998 as a movie. Um, scientist, futurist, and a romantic in his day job. In, in a sense. <laughs> um, I was educated down the road here in Hannes L. Vane's, uh, lab doing astrophysics, but I found that civilization is willing to pay me a lot more to be interesting than to be right. Um, I did uh, get the ALA's Freedom of Speech Award for the Transparent Society. That's a nonfiction book about freedom and secrecy, privacy. It's the only public policy uh, book from um, the 20th century in the whole Addison Wesley group that's still in print. I'm going to try to keep on schedule. I'm, I'm a professional. I do about 30, 40 talks a year, and this is the only time that I have written everything down in order to try to stay efficient. Uh, Rebecca Hineni, I am here. Um, I, I really liked that. Uh, in fact, I will name an alien luxion just to, just to prove how easy it is to do some things in science fiction. Um, I found the whole focus on religion during this um, discussion to be a bit of a distraction, even though I have a paper called 12 Modern Questions About Humanity's Relationship with Its Creator in the Context of an Age of Science. So there are people, um, this is an obvious attractor state to be interested in this. However, I found it a bit depressing, as a matter of fact, because I was attracted here today from the fire ravaged North County here because of the subtitle, Enlightenment 2.0, and I think that's a far more important question, quite frankly. Um, Deirdre McCloskey and John Haight spoke of how we tend to tendentiously rationalize things that we are already bent to, to uh, perceive or bent to believe, and I think that's a severe problem, and it is always a problem threatening the Enlightenment. Now, science fiction at its best frames new narratives for new eras. And I'm pleased to see Jonathan speak of opening up literary criticism, which if it had one trait above all else, was a venom, has been a venomous um, seven decade hatred of science fiction, which is essentially the literary form, the most American of all literary forms, the one that actually tries to do Gedanken experiments, to try to use the prefrontal lobes above our eyes that are the lamps on the brow that were reached mistranslated as horns, um, uh, but you, I can, speaking to a very erudite audience, you know exactly what I mean. But these lamps upon the brow that enable us to do thought experiments and Gedanken experiments about the future. And the neurological proof of this is, of course, that those who have experienced prefrontal lobotomies tend not to care about the future. They remain perfectly intelligent, but they tend not to make these thought experiments which is, of course, why I would much rather have a free bottle in front of me than a prefrontal lobotomy. Um, in any event, the point is, to zoop along, is that my job as a science fiction author is to deal with perspectives, to be more interesting than right. So let me offer you a quick perspective called The Great Silence or The Fermi Paradox. I have been engaged in thinking about the alien and our context in the universe, both as an astronomer and as a science fiction author. And um, the great silence, or the, when Fermi said, where the heck is everybody, is one of the great anchor questions of our age. Because Carl Sagan and so many others promised us that that's the SETI program would find these tutorial beacons. Deet, 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 oh, you're young. Here's, here's the solution to all your problems. These have not shown up. The people in the SETI community are in blind panic. And now they want to go screaming at the cosmos. Another story. Come to my website, davidbrin.com, and I'll tell you all about that battle. But the point is that the question of the great silence is an anchor around which many of our concerns can revolve. Because everybody who faces this question, why have the, the Drake equation, why have we not seen these creatures, these alien intelligences who mathematically we believe should have preceded us? 
Everybody has their own tendentious answer. Carl Sagan had his nuclear winter. Um, everybody comes up with, uh, I was, I'm among the only ones who tries to say, no, let's catalog a whole range of potential answers. Which is why I got so pissed off when we people were telling, trying to tell God what to do yesterday. Um, the, the point is that what's at stake implicitly in the Drake equation, uh, in the great uh, silence, is the whole notion of anybody being out there at all. And if nobody is out there at all, then something must be culling the numbers. And if something is culling the numbers, the natural tendency is to imagine any failure mode that we come across as being it. It could be uh, the physicists, uh, every, every civilization, the physicists eventually build uh, um, um, uh, cyclotrons big enough that they can make black holes and the, and the planet goes. I, mean, I even wrote a book about that. It's called Earth and she, you could, Patricia can hold up a, a copy. It has a lot of other things in it. But the point is, the point is that every time you think about a topic that could spoil our ability to become a mature starfaring civilization, not ours, but our descendants, to be as much better than us as the Enlightenment has enabled us to be better than our ancestors, then that has implications not just for us and the possibility of a very major tragedy and the loss of all of our potential in our libraries, but also the implication that we might have been the exception that could, could have spread through the galaxy and helped others. So I'm saying there's a bigger perspective to the success of the Enlightenment. Well, I agree with David Wilson that the relevant power of Darwinism, but if you look at this whole notion and step back Darwinistically, what if on some other planet tigers or sheep became intelligent? They would be different than us. We are the result of a confluence of a number of, of unlikely factors, gregarious apes, who are egotists and yet able to subsume their egotism like mad in alliance forming. We have a severely revised male reproductive system that has been obviously the most exaggerated sexual trait under female choice uh, selection uh, across the last half million years, plus highly variable K reproductive qualities. We are imaginative and passionate. The good news is that as a result of this, we're dynamic and reprogrammable. The bad news of this is that if you take a look at the, the uh, ecological and, and um, Darwinistic imperative, you see one basic fact. On every continent where human beings discovered metals and uh, agriculture, large men picked up metal implements and took other men's women and wheat. It, it loosely, if inaccurately, it's called feudalism. And it happened everywhere. And it, we are all descended from the uh, harem masters, the resulting harem masters, or from the nerds in spangled cloaks who danced alongside saying, isn't it good? He gets your women. Isn't it good? And they're taking the leadings from the table. These were the two dominant successful traits. And they appeared on all continents. Is it any wonder why so much fantasy is out there? Why you see so much romantic, romanticism and feudalism? Because of simple self-interest. You don't need to explain um, Joseph Campbell's stories about why everything was, all the tales were the same. The bards told the same stories in order to flatter the guys who had the beer. Simply, 8% of Chinese people seem to be descended from Genghis Khan. This history, driven, history that's driven, as Paul Churchland pointed out, by cabals of self-interest resulted in most human civilizations being shaped like a pyramid, with a few at the top lording it over masses below. Ours is the only human civilization, and this, rather than fractal Mandelbrot sets, should be our flag. We are the only civilization that's ever had a social hierarchy like this, in which the well-off outnumbered the poor, and it's had profound moral effects. When the poor were a vast sea, char the ob object of charity, and look it up, is to give alms to improve your own soul. When the well-off outnumber the poor, suddenly poverty is a bitter lake, and it's somebody's fault. And the diamond is rising, and we can imagine everybody churning upward and coming down, being only temporary. That's why we believe in, in health care for children, if Hillary had done this in 1993, instead of insisting for everybody, we would have had it by now. 
The fundamental of the Enlightenment is this. And it's, everybody's being so complicated. The fundamental of the Enlightenment is simply this. You'll never hear it. Uh, the fundamental of the Enlightenment is simply this. That, that recognition that self-interest is a fundamental human driver. And that it was kept under control in pyramidal cultures through force majeure and through chiding. And of course, with the lure of heaven and the threat of hell. And these never worked very well. And what we found instead was under the Enlightenment something very simple. Rousseau was wrong that we are angels warped by society, and Hobbes was wrong that we're devils who need society to keep us under rigid control. They were idiots. Locke stepped forward and said, look at your neighbors. They're both. And what we need is a civilization that manages to raise the angels of our better nature while suppressing the, 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 the demons. And no one person, no one king, no re one religion knows how to do that. The way to do it is us. And Locke's wager is that we can do it with flattened hierarchies and a magical term called reciprocal accountability. And RA, reciprocal accountability, that's the Enlightenment. It's markets. It's democracy. It's science and it's law courts, the four great accountability arenas. Write to me if you want my paper about it. It was the lead uh, article in the American Bar Association's Journal of um, Dispute Resolution. These four accountabilities aren't often compared to each other because their product that they're after and their processes are so different from each other. Science, we have an ultimate arbiter called objective reality, and so everything's kind of relaxed and cool. Markets are ferocious and filled with lies. Courts can't afford lies, so they are meticulous. The styles are different, and yet the fundamental of allowing maximal reciprocal accountability to play out with the minimizing of blood on the floor so that the players can keep coming back. This is the fundamental of the Enlightenment, and cheaters are always trying to get around it. And we are seeing a, the most recent attempt to destroy the Enlightenment by bringing back a yeah, Gilded Age. And I, I was, uh, you're looking at a guy who was a keynote speaker at a Libertarian Party con convention. And I said, half of you are going to give me a standing ovation and defend me from being lynched by the other half. Because I pointed out something fundamental. That, 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 that Adam Smith would have laughed in their faces at, with their obsession at government bureaucrats. The true enemy of, of, of markets throughout human history has been era aristocrats, cheating aristocrats. The point is that if you combine the Fermi mode, Fermi paradox quandary, with this very simple view of the Enlightenment, you run into a, a, a possible failure mode that could explain it all. What if, we, if all civilizations of gregarious apes like us simply slip permanently into an obligate pyramidal hierarchical society? As soon as they were warned by the sight of Pericles, the Platonists and the oligarchs jumped all over that experiment and kept it squelched for 2,000 years because they knew their common enemy. And if we fail, it's going to be 10,000 before we're allowed to try it again. That's what's at stake here. Sorry, I'm getting very rabble-roused here, and I want to talk to you about self-righteous indignation as a drug high, because I, I have a paper about that, and I'm convinced, I'm convinced that it's true, and you're looking at an addict here, but never mind. The point is, the basic traits of such civilizations are enforced hierarchy, restricted information flow, uh, rigidly as uh, kept assumptions. And among those assumptions, mimic frailty, the notion that the masses must be protected from, because they're frail, from bad ideas. And some of you are principal proponents of that notion of mimic frailty. The, the public has got to be protected from bad ideas. And the notion of zero-sum games, by all means, read one of the best books of the last 20, 30 years, uh, uh, Robert Wright's um, A Non-Zero. And the belief in incantations. And yes, all right, I'll throw a bone at throwing a bone at, at, at religion. The belief in that, that firm and rigid incantations can deal with our moral and, 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 and other behavior problems is a severe problem. 
Darren McMahon said, enlightenment is not the default human condition. That's fundamentally right. The default human condition is feudalism and other men taking your women and wheat and women having no choice. That's the default human condition. The enlightenment is an emergent property that happened because these gregarious apes were able to, to, to see another attractor state. One that is vastly more fecund, vastly more creative, vastly more effective. A metazoan state, but one that is very, very difficult to get across. Every generation has had to face this problem. And every generation has an addition. Since the discovery of glass lenses and, and movable type, every generation has had to deal with another problem. Prosthetics of vision, prosthetics of memory, and prosthetics of attention. Back then it was simple glass lenses, telescopes, um, a movable type, and perspective. And these three things utterly changed everything. And elites said, the frail masses can't deal with this. And for the first 30 years they were right. The first result of the movable type and the glass lenses was the 30 years of war and pornography. And as you go through the, um, the list, you can always add the phrase and pornography to every single edition of prostheses, of prosthetics for vision, prosthetics of memory. I have an entire talk about this that I gave at Google. It's an hour and a half long, and I'm going to simply segue to that if you want to see it. Because it is about discourse, it is about these revolutions in uh, the prosthetics of, of, of vision and memory, and, and, and that, enough of that. The point is, the point is that, that these, these incantations are drugs, just like self-righteous indignation. And the whole point of this is that sages, philosophically, sages since the beginning of Western civilization have said one thing over and over and over again, and it's true. We can never see objective reality. We can never know what objective reality is. Our senses are imperfect. You know, uh, Plato in the cave. But then the sages all did the exact same thing. And I can't believe how few people have noticed this pattern. They all then said, therefore, give up. And seek, and seek uh, truth through. And the differences among these prescriptions are far less than the similarities. Through faith, through incantation, through uh, Zen, through, through um, uh, logic and reason. And it's all mumbo jumbo. Galileo came along and he said the second half, that's in here. He said the second half, he said, said, you're right. I cannot know what this is. I cannot know firmly and perfectly what this is, but I refuse to give up. Through critical analysis, through experimentation, and through reciprocal accountability of my peers, I can find out what it's not. And you all recognize that that's what science is about. And the amazing thing about it is, we have these two worlds, the worlds of romanticism. And I was born to be a romantic, but I, am a rom I, I tried to be a serious guy for a while in science, and now I consider myself a romantic in service of the Enlightenment. So I'm betraying my own kind. The point is, the point is that, that the romantics, the romantics believe passionately in the superiority of subjectivity. Jonathan was talking about this exactly in the critics. The, the, the superiority of subjective triumph of the will over the objective and despise of the objective. That's the whole notion of postmodernism. Scientists know they will never see the objective, but they plan on poking at it forever so that the cloud will give them information. Now, I promised to be the only guy to stay to 15 minutes, and I'm going to cheat by just three more. I'm going to stick to it. The major tasks of the uh, traits of the Enlightenment are suspicion towards subjectivity, uh, Rogers, uh, Rogers' quote from Ibn al-Khatan was wonderful. I've got, to, I've got to get the exact quote from him. And rejecting the bludgeons of forced and forced um, human behavior and repression 
and, and using of preaching and repression to control human behavior. Is it any wonder that people instinctively rebel against this, especially at times when the prosthetics, the new waves of prosthetics for vision and memory are may giving us godlike abilities to see and hear. I spoke in one of my responses just, just yesterday about how one of our problems is we simply got the temporal arrow wrong. <coughs> Gods did not, perhaps they did not exist. They will. How many of you have ever flown through the sky? How many of you have ever walked into a room and made light happen with your fingertip? We're in the process of making gods, and that brings up the whole notion of the singularity, and I don't want, I, I have an essay. All right, look. I don't have time to get into any of this, but Locke's wager is actually very simple. And we don't have to beat up on Unitarians. The people who committed us to Locke's wager were all Unitarians, and we got across there. What we can do is we can commit ourselves to the thing that enables reciprocal accountability to work in courts, in democracy, in science, and in markets. And that's knowledge. When everybody knows pretty much what's going on, they can be players in Smith's, uh, in Smith's market. They can be players in democracy. Transparency is not the end-all, be-all, and I'm not saying that, that secrecy is the root of all e evil, but name for me an evil that is not made worse by secrecy. So with that, uh, I actually, oh, self-righteous indignation. Oh, I want to talk to Adam Colbert and, and Patricia about that at some point. The allure of classic patterns is the weakness of the Enlightenment. And we have to be clear who the enemy is. The enemy is human nature. We have to have sympathy to our brethren and sisters in our civilization. Because <coughs> we give in to all these temptations ourselves, as I have clearly demonstrated by this self-righteous rant. So, uh, all right. <laughs> So well, I was close. You were close. While, while Kent is um, plugging in whatever he needs to plug in, Kent? Anybody? We will ask questions. Do you have any questions? Uh, I, 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 sp I spoke a little fast. I'd like to kind of, uh, Pat Churchland, tell us about getting high on self-righteousness. There is a small group at USC that's interested in pursuing this, but over the last 10 years, I have seen nibbles and hints at what I think should be, be a core um, research topic for psychopharmacology, uh, and that is, look, we already know that rage and some other uh, um, exaggerated emotional states produce drug-like highs, um, uh, endorphin levels, dopamine, all that sort of thing. We know about addiction. What is so hard to imagine about the deleterious effects of self-righteous indignation on our body politic and on our ability to engage in discourse? Every wing of every political movement is taken over by those who have the stamina and the passion to take over and bully the moderates. The result is a decay of social discourse that could be lethal to our civilization and lethal to this enlightenment. And all that you people need to do is show demonstratively, clearly, openly, and decisively that self-righteous indignation is an addictive drug high. That's not all that we need, but you give us bullets Oh, would you give us bullets in almost every single um, advocacy group. You give us finally a weapon to fight back against, against the people who may agree with us on the specific issue of the, of the movement, of the specific group, but are enemies of that, the enemies of the Enlightenment. And it has nothing, uh, sometimes it has nothing to do with the specifics of the political. Although God knows our specific politics really
are in trouble right now. All right. Thank you.